Hello everyone and welcome to my Ninja Gaiden 3 PlayStation Move Controls analysis. Here I will explain how the game works with the move, trying my best to avoid spoilers in the process. There is a lot to go through, so let's dive in and cut to the chase. Actually, before we get to the controls, I'd like to quickly walk you through the game startup process, because it provides an early indication about the quality of the move implementation we are dealing with, which I'm afraid is not a good one. So, from the point of view of a move user, here is how your first contact with the Ninja Gaiden 3 plays out. For starters, contrary to when using the DualShock 3, these splash screens are not skippable when using the PlayStation Move. And then, when you get to the saving disclaimer screen here, you can't proceed any farther, no matter how hard you spunk the buttons. It turns out this is because the game assumes you are holding a DualShock 3 controller and is therefore ignoring inputs coming from either the navigation or the move controller. So the only way to get past this screen is to manually assign the navigation controller to port 1, which is the default DualShock 3 port, while the navigation defaults to 7. Done that, you finally reach the title screen, which is where you get stuck again, since pressing start or any other button on the move controller does nothing. Luckily though, pressing X on the navigation controller works, so you can get past this screen and eventually reach the menus, which you navigate using the navigation stick. So, let's start a new game. Here you get the option to choose between a normal and a hard difficulty settings, but uh, you better avoid doing that cause neither supports the move. More on this later. What you need to do instead is select the hero mode. Now here you see you can access some uh, move controller settings by pressing triangle. Problem is, pressing triangle on the move does nothing because the move is yet to be detected. In fact, if you go back to the main menu and check the controller settings from there, you see there is no reference to the move controller whatsoever. So you are left with no other choice but to just select the hero option and hope for the best. Here is when the game finally asks if you want to use the move. So you select yes and by doing that you are brought to the controller settings screen where a new motion controller entry magically shows up. For whatever reason it's set to off, so you need to manually set it to on. Done that, you are informed that you can't use the cinema clip feature and asked if that's ok. So you select yes and finally the calibration begins, which is a rather simple point at the camera, press the move button process. Done that, you can see the controls have changed, and so, finally, you are all set to play the game. Not quite a smooth start for a move compatible product. Ok, now let's see how the controls work, starting from the navigation controller. Operating its analog stick allows to move around freely. Holding L1 allows to block and tilting the stick whilst holding L1 allows to slide in the corresponding direction, as well as to avoid obstacles during set pieces like this one. Tapping either X or the main move button allows to jump as well as to perform various ninja acrobatics such as the wall runs and jumps. A new action called Kunai Climb allows to climb specific walls alternating the L1 button and the move trigger, which feels slightly odd because you are operating two very different kinds of button, a digital one and an analog one. Instead of just replacing L1 with trigger, a better solution would have been to replace L1 with L2 as well, in order to preserve some sort of symmetry in the way your fingers operate. 
Anyway, tilting the stick sideways while holding on the wall allows to jump in the corresponding direction. Pressing circle you can throw daggers at enemies looking down from above, while pressing triangle you can knock out those unaware of your arrival. A similar mechanic to that of the kunai climb allows to cross ropes, but here an erroneous on-screen prompt prevents you from jumping off. Apologies for the lack of hands at the bottom, the camera stopped recording at this point, but you can see how the prompt is blinking as I hopelessly push the move button. Hopefully this issue is only present in the review code this video is based upon, but just in case, what you need to do here is press X rather than the move button. Finally, to throw shurikens you press the circle button. And by pressing circle and triangle simultaneously when this bar is full, you cast the Ninpo, which obliterates enemies before regenerating a portion of your life bar. Ok, now let's take a look at the katana attacks, which is where the woggling comes into play. There are two basic attacks, a quick one performed by swinging the move horizontally, and a strong one executed by swinging the move vertically. On the top of the waggling system, attack buttons are still supported, resulting in a hybrid solution which allows to perform any action involving square or triangle with the respective motion-based surrogate. So you can counter like this, or charge your attacks like this. By the way, performing the latter action while your sword is glowing red triggers a devastating technique. Now, with the help of the move list, which you can bring up at any time by pressing select, I'd like to start discussing the many reasons why the move implementation in Ninja Gaiden 3 is ultimately pointless and ill-conceived. Notice here how the waggling inputs are represented as the corresponding buttons. Now, let's perform a simple combo using buttons and then attempt to replicate it via move flicks. As you can see, pulling it off with flicks is quite problematic. This is because motion detection sensitivity is set so high, it's almost impossible for the system to clearly make a distinction between vertical and horizontal slashes, unless you stop in between the motions, which is something you can't afford because of the timing you need to adhere to in order to successfully pull off the intended combo. When you do succeed, it's purely accidental. It goes without saying that this unreliability results in a pretty much pointless waggling solution, so you end up using buttons as they provide the necessary accuracy to be creative with your combos. As for the finishers, you can put them off by simply shaking the controller a missed opportunity to put the move technology to some meaningful use. Of course you can pretend you need to swing the move accordingly to the animations, like I'm doing here, but it hardly feels rewarding since it's not mandatory for success. Now here is another issue. Pay close attention to my button presses as I try to pull off some aerial combos and compare them to what's actually being detected by looking at the top of the moves list. Take him down. Notice how, no matter how many times I press the square button after having lifted the enemy up in the air with triangle, the combo ends abruptly with a quick downward strike. Now let me explain why this happens. As I've mentioned previously, the move sensitivity is quite high, so high indeed that controller vibrations are misinterpreted as vertical swings. Since the move vibrates when you lift up an enemy, the game thinks you have pressed triangle twice rather than once, and therefore initiates an unintended downward strike. In fact, let me show you what happens if I disable the vibration.
As you can see, I can successfully perform my aerial combo now. Killing is my business! So not only is a waggly mechanic pointless, but even if you ignore it and use just the buttons, it does still manage to compromise your effectiveness unless you disable the vibration functionality. Sadly it's not possible to disable the waggly, so you need to sacrifice the rumble. Now you might be wondering how you control the camera with the move. Well, you don't. As a consequence of the ill-conceived decision to implement motion-based attacks, camera control has been inhibited. The only thing you can do is center it behind Ryu by pulling the trigger. And that's in spite of the fact that a motion-based camera control system is actually implemented, but limited to the archery mechanics, which I will discuss in a second. While not really a game-breaker, the decision to severely limit camera control is as much an inconvenience the developers brought upon themselves as it is a testament of the laziness in figuring out an alternative solution, such as, for example, being able to orientate the camera by tilting the controller while holding down the move button. After all, the current implementation has the move button simply mirroring the jump functionality already assigned to the X1, so it's basically a wasted button right there. As for the archery mechanics, holding down L2 zooms in while pulling trigger shoots the arrows. In this state you can freely look and aim around through a fixed reticle. The sensitivity is fairly low, so you need to tilt the move quite a bit to reach a decent speed. Since camera orientation is strictly tied to tilt detection, the move has to be perfectly horizontal to prevent the camera from pitching upwards the second you zoom in which is something that happens quite often since you naturally tend to hold the move pointed slightly upwards. Actually, this is more of a theoretical issue rather than a practical one, because when there are enemies around, the camera locks automatically onto those with the highest priority, so you don't ever need to acquire targets manually. This lock-on system is also in place when using the DualShock 3, by the way. Speaking of which, zooming and shooting works in a similar fashion when using a traditional controller, but in this case you can also shoot from the hip, so to speak, by simply pressing R2. Even while jumping. You can't do any of this with the move since pulling the trigger centers the camera as we have seen earlier. Again, this is another limitation brought to you by the pointless waggling. Not a huge one, cause you generally zoom in regardless to take advantage of the auto lock, but still worth mentioning. As pointed out at the beginning of this analysis, move support is limited to the hero mode, which basically means move users don't have access to the higher difficulty settings, nor to any of the content behind the Shadows of the World entry here, which includes the online multiplayer mode, the ninja trials, and even the training. What's so special about the hero mode so that it's the only one actually supporting the move? I think the answer might lie in the lack of a camera control and its consequences on the overall game difficulty. Hero mode is indeed super easy, with less enemies to deal with at any one time and an assist that has real blocking and evading attacks automatically when he's very low on health. <laughs> Having played both the normal and hard modes, I didn't really find myself in a situation where the move control system would have made surviving that much more difficult. Using buttons and disabling vibration makes you as efficient with the move as you are with the DualShock 3, and while you can't easily rotate the camera, the centering option does still provide enough control over it that you never really feel at such a serious disadvantage to justify switching to the DualShock 3. So, at the end of the day, I'm not completely sure about the logic behind this move support segregation. What I'm pretty confident about, though, is that a much better job could have been done with the move implementation overall if the developers had not followed the pointless waggling path. After all, the move has buttons, and using them in combination with a tilt-based camera control system would have been enough to make it worthy, even if no waggling was involved. Ah! 
So here is a quick reimagination of Ninja Gaiden 3 I've put together to try and see how it could have possibly been by adopting a different approach to the move implementation. Have a look. And so this is it. Hope you enjoyed this analysis. Sayonara. Ciao. You. <laughs> You're not human.